Well, hello, hello. My name is Minister Suzanne Isaac, and I'm very excited today. We are launching uh, David's Deception by Sabrina J. And uh, I have uh, Sabrina here that we're going to hear all about the book in a little while. Uh, but first, I want to introduce myself. I am Minister Suzanne Isaac. I am the founder of a wonderful support group for women. It's an encouragement, inspiration, and empowerment uh, group uh, that I host on Wednesday evenings. And I've been ordained as a minister, mainly for community outreach. I am also a founder of a Starlight Shine program in Ghana, Africa, which sponsors uh, the youth education for underserved children. As a breast cancer survivor, my mission is to educate the community about early detection. And I also serve as a mentor to other breast cancer patients. So today I'm very excited. Sabrina, welcome. Well, welcome. thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, before I get into um, the exciting book, I would like to just uh, let you know about Sabrina J. Songoa. Uh, she's the founder of Sabrina J. Inspiration, which is a faith-based business that provides inspirational speaking, marketing, consulting, and life purpose coaching services. As a certified life coach, Sabrina has helped individuals break free from defeated mindsets, past hurt, and negative self-truth to allow God's purpose to shine through. Sabrina uh, is well-educated. She holds multiple degrees. She's got a master's in marketing, a bachelor's in mass communication, and an associate's in accounting. So welcome again, Sabrina. Thank you. Congratulations Sabrina. on your, the launch of your book, David's Deception. I'm very excited uh, to get into it and just to share with your readers. Um, so let's start by asking you, what was your inspiration for the book? Yes, yeah, so I started writing David's Deception about 17 years ago. And at the time, my inspiration was to really just to vent and to share my story because we all have a story to tell. And I thought mine was very interesting um, and I just wanted to get it out there. So that was the initial inspiration for the book 17 years ago. Awesome. And... You know, tell us, you said 17 years ago and you just launched it. Um, I know you mentioned something about hearing a revelation from the Holy Spirit. Can you share that experience with us? Yes. So, you know, everyone has a story, but not everyone has a message. So 17 years ago, I had a story, but God told me to hold off on that story until I was able to really clearly see the message in my journey. And it has taken me 17 years, but I was in um, church last year doing a church service. And the topic of the sermon was, how do you feel about you? How do you see you? And it was all about Christians who don't love themselves and have low self-esteem. And how can you show the love of Christ when you don't even have love for yourself? You don't have love in your heart. You can't even receive it. And at the end of that sermon, he had an altar call. And I was shocked to see how many people filled that altar, but it wasn't just young people. It was older people, people in, in walkers and, and um, wheelchairs. And it was all demographics as well. And I was so moved and I stood there crying. Um, and the revelation I received in that moment was for once, I didn't have to go down to that altar because I had been through my own journey of self-love of discovery and healing, and I was in a far better place. And that's when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that is the message in the book. So now that you're able to clearly see the message, now you're ready to tell your story. And so here I am, 17 years later, releasing David's Deception. Wow. And, you know, there was something that you said about um, the masses, you know, and doing it for the one. Uh, tell us about that. So I think as a speaker, as a coach, as a writer, you want to have a large following because you're thinking about 
you know, book sales, you, you're thinking that why would I release a book and then only, you know, touch a few. So I was holding off also um, to grow my following. And one day the Holy Spirit really um, dealt with me about that as well. And what Jesus said to me was, will you do it for the one? You know, we always talk about being faithful over a few and God will make you ruler over many. But he said, what if the many never come? Will you mm -hmm. still do it for the one person who needs to hear it? Wow. And he really showed me like the individuals that I have come across over the last 17 years who would have really benefited from my story um, that I didn't touch because I was holding off for a larger audience. Wow. Wow. What a revelation. Yeah. The one. Now, you know, the book's title is called David's Deception. And, you know, the story and the title kind of, you know, goes along with that. But there's so much more to the book. And, you know, there were red flags, you know, as I read the book, um, there were several red flags. And how would you have handled things differently moving forward? Ooh, so <laughs> the, the book definitely does um, point out some deceptions, right? Hence the name. Um, and it talks about my younger years in life, but also throughout my life, right? I, I had similar experiences in different relationships. And looking back now that I'm on the other side of it and I'm in a, a better place mentally um, and um, I've been through my journey of healing, if I could go back, the only thing that I could really do differently to change that situation was to love myself more, to value myself more um, than I did at the time and to love myself more than I love the other person. Wow. Wow. So... Basically, what you're saying is that when we don't love ourselves, we miss those red flags. We Not that we miss them. We disregard them. We pretend not to see them, right? Because we have like this desperation inside of us to hold on to that person at all costs. Wow. Wow. Which comes to my next question. In the book, you mentioned faulty foundations. Can you explain or give examples of faulty foundation? How can someone identify uh, faulty foundations in their own relationships, whether it's a, a romantic relationship or a family relationship, work relationships? Um, how can uh, someone um, identify those faulty foundations? Mm, great question. You know, every foundation begins with you. It begins with me, the individual. So when I say we build relationships on faulty foundations as unstable as quicksand, it's because at the core of that they were broken. Our mindset, our thought process for getting entering into that relationship was broken. Um, I can even extend that beyond relationships because we all know if you're broken and you connect yourself with someone else, you can't get wholeness out of two broken parts, right? You have to be whole, they have to be whole, and then you join your yourselves together. And that's rare, rarely um, how relationships are formed, right? We we have a, a void we're trying to fill, and instead of spending time alone with ourselves to heal and understand why we have that void, we fill it with stuff. We fill it with things. We fill it with titles. We fill it with jobs. And we take that on as our identity. And we hold on to that person or to that thing for dear life. And that indeed is a faulty foundation. That should never be your foundation for anything. If you feel like you can't live without a person or live without a job, then you seriously have lost sight of who you are and the purpose for that relationship in the first place. Wow. Now, if you were to conduct an autopsy on every poor decision in your life, you would find that there was always a moment of truth, a crossroads. Well, you had to choose between trusting God or yielding to the voice of your fears. At what point in your journey did you discover that moment of truth? So in my journey, can I say trial and error? <laughs> we always say hindsight is twenty twenty. And as someone who was trying to outrun a voice in my head, a voice of failure in my head, 
I was always trying to find that next best thing. So as you've seen in my bio, I have several degrees, always trying to outdo my last success because the voice in my head still said, you're still a failure, right? Um, but there was a point in my life where I was making a very big move, maybe twice. I could say two times in my life where I decided to make a big move, right? That everything in me told me to stay, but I was in an uncomfortable situation. So instead, and when you're in an uncomfortable situation, you want out at all costs. So then you start to make up a new narrative in your mind. Like I have to leave because A, B, and C, but the Holy Spirit is saying, trust me, like this season is doing a far greater work in you than, that you don't see right now. But fear tells you, move forward. If you stay here, X, Y, Z is going to happen. So I've had two times where I got my life so far off track by not listening to that voice, by not yielding and trusting God in that moment. And I'm like, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to pray. God's going to bless my endeavor. And he did not bless my endeavor. I hit rock bottom both times. Um, so I learned enough to say, you know what? <laughs> Sometimes it's best to just stand still, right? And see what God's going to do. If you know, if something's telling you, don't move, you really should not. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to just um, change the topic just slightly. I know that words are very powerful. And what we speak over our children or what we say to each other, and even ourselves, is very, very powerful. And that's why we shouldn't just blurt out words, especially words that can have negative impact on our lives and the decisions that we make. So how do words or declarations spoken by parents, siblings, friends, coworkers, how does that impact the future, whether it's negative or positive? Oh, wow. So in David's deception, you will see an underlying thing was, I was trying to outlive a word that was spoken to me um, in my younger years. And that kind of really haunted me for years. And beyond that, the more I dig back, the more I look over my, my childhood experiences, there was words spoken by siblings, you know, and, and, and kids, right. Um, that really compounded the issue and is affected the way I saw myself. So words do have power. And, and as a parent, it's, it's, your, it's your job, it's your duty, your responsibility to make sure that you use your words to empower your, your kids rather than to tear them down, whether you do it intentionally or out of frustration, right? Because you can't unring a bell. They say once, once you put it out there, you can't take it back. You can apologize for it. But somewhere in that person's mind, they're going to think, but you really feel that way. You know, you said it, you feel that way. So it's, it's, it's very important to be mindful of the things that we speak not only to others, but to ourselves, right? So many times our biggest problems are the words we speak to ourselves, but at the foundation of the root of the words we speak to ourselves is usually some words that were spoken to us by someone else. So words are very powerful. Definitely agree. And in the book, you mentioned that God, you know, speaking about ourselves, um, you mentioned that God will allow us to go through a season of isolation so that we can get to know who we really are. And I think that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. And you're a certified life and purpose coach. Uh, tell us about what a life and purpose coach, um, how they would help someone get in to know themselves, their true self. What are the first steps as a coach that you would advise your clients? Oh, yes, definitely. So everyone wants to know what their purpose is. And rightfully so, because it's like, why were we put here on this earth if not to fulfill a purpose that's higher than ourselves? Um, so a lot of times we are lost, confused, trying to figure it out. And then you hire a life and purpose coach to help you. Um, the first step I always have my clients do is answer the question, who are you? Who am I? Right. Um, and then I listen as they provide the answer. And a lot of times it's covered in the roles they pay. It's covered, it's covered in titles 
or it's covered in that mask, that thing they put on as a defense mechanism. So it's like, I'm guarded, you know, I'm, I'm very strict. I'm very hard on other people. But why are you that way? Why do you think that's a strength and not a flaw, right? Um, so a, a lot of getting to the core of who you are has to do with being honest with yourself about yourself and really confessing this is why I operate the way I operate. At the that the root of this thing is an insecurity that I hold about myself that I'm covering up. And the problem with covering that thing up is you're covering up who you really are with somebody you're pretending to be, right? Um, so the first step is, you know, doing that hard, the hard work of pulling off the layers of the things that the world have, has put on you to so you get down to the core of who you are and deal with that. Because a lot of times, God has already showed you, exposed you to your purpose, but you didn't believe that you can receive it or walk in it because you don't see that as who you are because you have masked your identity for so long. Wow. What is the message behind David's deception? I know it's about your own personal story, but what is the overall message that you want your readers to know? Yes, Susan. So it is a great book and the story is very interesting. I tell it in a very entertaining way. It is about a part of my life that was very trying. And I wanted to tell it because people, we all go through our struggles um, and we normally see people on the other side of their struggle where they are just, you know, walking in their truth and we admire them, but we never know the process it took for them to get there. So that was one reason I wanted to tell my story to show like I went through it. I was lowered and low. And, and one day God disposed me to a higher truth and I had to walk that thing out. But then also um, as a, a purpose coach, I meet women every day, not just young people, although I'm telling a story about a time in my life where I was very young, um, but women um, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, right? Experiencing the same things that I experienced back then. So I wanted to tell my story so they can see themselves in that story. You know, the wife who allows her husband to spend time with, time with his mistress and she looks the other way. You know, the, the young woman in her 30s who allow her boyfriend to talk down to her and make her feel inadequate. Or the girlfriend who sees all the red flags, but she chooses to ignore them because she has low self-esteem and she doesn't value herself. I wanted them to see themselves in my story and then realize that there is a better way. You know, God showed me a higher truth about myself um, that he He freely extends to all of us, right? Um, but we just can't see it when we are blinded. And so I wanted to help them open their eyes through my testimony. Wow, wow. I was truly, truly inspired by your book. You know, I've read the book. I find it to be so inspirational. And as you read this book about Sabrina's journey, you'll find that it's it's a little bit of a roller coaster filled with thoughts and twists that you may not see coming. Um, you will read about her lowest moments of despair, but you will also read about her strength and resilience to overcome the many challenges she faced. My favorite part of the book is that moment where, you know, you have that re that revelation, you know, and realize what and who is really important and how your faith in God and Jesus Christ gave you the courage to continue to rise above the ashes. You know, I just want to say uh, to the readers, you know, for those of you going through something difficult, or even if you know someone, it's a beautiful reminder that God can take what we believe to be the worst of circumstances and turn it into something great. We can rest assured that God will come alongside us with love and comfort. So thank you, Sabrina, for being brave to share your journey. Um, this book, David's Deception, uh, it's going to inspire others to seek God for their own healing and mm -hmm. journey of self-love. So. Thank you for, for sharing your story. I was truly, truly inspired. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for that great um, review of the book. And I truly want to just close out and, and pray over those who read the book because I really feel like I'm sowing seeds with this book. 
um, that, of course, I sow the seed. One man plants, one man water. It's God and Jesus who gives the increase. So I pray over all who come in contact with David's deception, those who are reading it for entertainment and those who are reading it for self-healing. I pray that through my journey, through my tears, through my fears, through my struggles and triumphs, that you begin to see the beauty of God's presence in your own. I pray that the love of Jesus permeate your heart and mind on today. And with every page, with every message laid out in the book, that you begin to see your journey more clearly, that you let go of fear and you begin to walk in truth and faith, that you no longer put on someone else's identity, a false identity, but you take the time out to discover your true identity, something that's so beautiful, so unique, so designed for you, that you're doing yourself in the world of disservice by not fully embracing it. I thank you on today. I hope that you get the book. It's now available on Amazon. Um, print an ebook for all who desire to read it. Thank you again, Sabrina. Good, good luck. And